Hi. Hi. Bonjour. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning. Kalimera. Good night. Hello. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Dzień dobry. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It is a unique opportunity and an honor to be part of this project that unites the young generation and raises its awareness for issues which can only be solved collectively. In Sweden, we believe that it should not matter where you come from, what you believe in, or your skin color. What matters should be your actions, your thoughts, and your mind. I deeply acknowledge that every single one of the almost 500 faces I'm looking at right now comes along with a different mindset and different proposals. But since Europe means unity, we'll focus on embracing our differences, outgrowing our contradictions, and thus moving forward. The European Union wouldn't be the way it is without the input of every single member state. And we, as young people, are responsible to not waste any opportunities and to create our countries, therefore EU, the way we want them to be. Thank you. Acho. This day happens to lie between two uh, traditional Romanian um, holidays. Well, one of them was on Monday, called Dragobete, is a sort of uh, a Romanian Valentine's Day, if you like. Uh, and uh, there's another one this Sunday called Marcișor, which marks the beginning of spring. And uh, because of this, we would like to wish you lots of love and may you have a prosperous year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bonjour Strasbourg. I was 16 when I was doing what you were doing and I was 32 when I became a member of the European Parliament uh, years ago. Um, of course, then you start as a backbencher, uh, specializing in certain topics. I was specializing in um, environment, food law, agriculture, uh, so very concrete topics. And uh, since five years, five years ago in the European elections, or six years ago, I was the uh, list leader for my party in the Netherlands at CDA. Uh, so the number one on the list, uh, that's a completely different ballgame because then you have to do the national debates, the TV debates, uh, and I became the, uh, um, the, the leader of the Dutch Christian Democrats in the European Parliament and vice president of the European People's Party. So that is uh, pretty much what I do now. I work in the area of climate and the environment and uh, also in uh, economic and um, uh, monetary affairs and uh, as vice president I coordinate the work of uh, about six different um, committees in the European Parliament so not only the economy and environment but also transport the internal market uh, social affairs uh, etc my question is in practice do you believe that the human rights are equally defended are equally defended within Europe or within the relations with third countries. Um, maybe give, I will give you uh, a couple of examples on how we try to do that. Of course, that's never easy, but uh, for example, I was in Mexico two years ago. And uh, it was at the time that, um, uh, well, you know, Donald Trump is still building his wall between America and Mexico. And the Mexicans were very, very worried because uh, their main trading partner is the United States. So they also wanted to talk to the EU about a trade agreement uh, with the EU. And we kept telling them, for the EU, agreements are never only about trade, they are also about other things. And in Mexico, um, journalists are disappearing. Uh, people in certain regions, there are huge amounts of murders that are never cleared up. You call that impunity, you know? You can do crimes and you're not punished for it. So that's a huge problem uh, in the field of, of human rights. And we said to the Mexican authorities, yes, we want to talk about trade, but we also want to talk about all these other things. And you could tell that, you know, some people didn't like that. They were like, okay, with the Americans, we just want to trade. 
you know, and this is how we like it. But for us as Europeans, when we talk about human rights, it's not only human rights for Europeans in Europe, but it's also human rights elsewhere in the world. And of course, it's very easy to only put your finger, you know, point at other parts in the world, whereas in the, in the EU itself, we still have enough to do. We have uh, problems with the rule of law in a number of countries um, where we shouldn't look away and pretend that this is not happening. And uh, it's the European Parliament that keeps pushing to say we should also talk about, for example, rule of law problems in the EU itself. Um, the Council of Ministers, you know, um, our colleagues that represent the member states, they are a bit more careful in that area because they think, oh, I don't want to blame my colleague from another member state. Um, you know, maybe I need him or her in, a, in other negotiations. So we are not perfect, absolutely not in the EU. But uh, in the European Parliament, we try to keep pushing this agenda. And I just gave you one example of how we push human rights, for example, the rule of law in the EU, and how we try to do that also in, uh, in other countries around the world. Because yes, if you believe that human rights are indivisible, they should apply in similar ways, no matter where you are in Europe, no matter where you are in the world. What would you consider to be the biggest accomplishment of the European Union? And what will be the worst and why? Hmm. Well, the biggest accomplishment, I think, of the EU is that we now take it completely for granted that countries in Europe or on the European continent get along. And that they, when there is a problem, they meet, they sit around the table and they try to solve it. This is not something that, you know, my grandparents' generation would have believed. Uh, for my grandmothers, uh, generation, you know, my grandmother lived very close to the border between the Netherlands and Germany. So she's, she has lived through a world war. And for her, Europe was an instrument to make sure that, you know, fighting between Germany and, and uh, France and all the other co uh, countries that came along with it would never happen again. My, my parents' generation, they saw the Wirtschaftswunder, you know, the economy in Europe getting better and better because countries also started trading more with each other. And my generation takes all of that for granted. We find it completely normal that we have peace, that we have stability, that we have, um, uh, you know, a, a relatively uh, wealthy life. But it's not automatic if you see what goes on in the world around us. So the biggest achievement is, is basically the success of, of, the, of, of the EU in, in, in you know, making this automatic. And this is at the same time the biggest vulnerability among you, the, the, the younger generation, because you're not like my grandmother's generation. You don't think, oh dear, you know, maybe the Germans and, and the French will start fighting again. You don't think that. You're very used, unlike my parents' generation, uh, you know, to, 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 to living in, a, in the wealthiest continent in the world. Um, but this success also makes the EU very vulnerable because it means that nobody or a lot of people think this is so automatic. We don't need to fight for the EU again to stick our neck out and to say this is a good thing. Let's make it better. Um, uh, you will hear a lot of people in national debates say, uh, I like Europe, but I don't like the EU. Or I would like to be in the EU, but I only want to trade. In other words, you know, no more free movement of people. Once people start saying that, things are going to fall apart. Let's be aware of that. And I don't think we should let that uh, happen. So the biggest success is at the same time, you understand, at the moment, the biggest vulnerability. So we need also the younger generation to say, hey, uh, the EU might not be perfect, but we've built something very, very precious in 70 years. And yes, we should make it better, but we are not the generation, like some political parties would wish, you know, that wants this construction to fall apart again. 
a great amount of 44 billion euros has been offered to Africa in order to raise significant sustainable investments. Do you think that this was enough to mobilize a whole continent which consists of 1.3 billion people, while half of them have not any experience in electricity supplies? Let me also clarify that I'm asking you because climate change and energy resources are global issues and the international community has yet to understand it. Mm. Very well said. And uh, of course, um, no matter how many billions from the European budget alone will never be enough, you know, for Africa. And Jean-Claude Juncker has also said that Europe has a certain responsibility, actually a great responsibility to make sure that Africa is doing well. And that is in our interest as well. If you know that in the next decades, for example, the population of Africa is going to double from 1.25 to 2.5 billion inhabitants. If you want you know, to make sure that um, uh, people have chances at home so that they don't on a massive scale start to migrate, migration towards Europe would be you know, the first choice, you have to make sure that people see possibilities and chances and opportunities at home. And you don't only do that through the European budget, you know, that was the example that you gave, how many money went from the budget to Africa. I think you also do that by giving Africa the opportunity to trade with the EU. And I also uh, say this to, to, to my colleagues in the European Parliament, listen, if you want to do agreements with Africa about controlling migration, you cannot at the same time say, we don't want to buy tomatoes from Morocco or olive oil from the north of Africa. Um, you know, to, you need to provide economic development so people have opportunities also at home. And then I think it's very interesting that you're working on the issue of renewable energies, because think of what we could do if we would have cooperation with Africa, especially, you know, you coming from Greece, from the Netherlands, it's a bit far, but uh, Southern Europe linked with Africa when it comes to, for example, a network for solar energy, that would create great opportunities for us in the EU and also for Africa. So I think what we need is an and, and, and approach. Yes, the budget, like you said, but the budget will never be big enough. So the main opportunities lie in issues like trade, like economic development, and why not? Renewable energies, it's one of the, like you say, issues for the future, and I think we could help each other there. So. Thank you very much for your questions and your, uh, your attention today. And I hope that just like I was sitting uh, in Strasbourg, uh, you know, 16 years before I became a member of the European Parliament, I'm hoping that maybe less than 16 years from now, uh, some of you will be, uh, you know, sitting in, in that chamber and the one in Brussels as members of the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Our mentality should focus on humanity and environmental cautiousness, and the key to success is education. At the same time, social media, for instance Instagram, can be effective to people's awareness. If used in a constructive way, television, internet networking and radio can be the main source of information. Furthermore, we should recycle in a smart way. In other words, we should uh, recycle in specific days and collect specific rubbish. For instance, uh, in Monday we can recycle plastic. In this way, both people and government will be forced to, rec to recycle. People who have rubbish other than plastic, paper, aluminium will have to pay for getting rid of the other uh, rubbish. Moreover, we should reduce meat production and CO2 emissions. We should eat let me meat, but how? People should become more conscious. We should make people understand that much meat is unhealthy for a person's health as well uh, and sometimes meat itself is not in a good quality. At first, uh, we agree that uh, human rights are fundamental, but there is a limit here. We have to respect the other. 
The European Union views all human rights as universal, indivisible and interdependent. It actively promotes and defends them both within its borders and when engaging in relations, in relations sorry, with non-European Union countries. Secondly, we talked about fake news. We should separate the fake news from real news in order for us to be well informed. Then uh, we talked about democracy. Actually, democracy is the only practical system which can fully realize all human rights, at least about security, as regard, as regard uh, security, combined, combating uh, cross-border crime and terrorism is a common European uh, responsibility. Actually, stop terrorism requires talking issues, foreign fighters, border controls and uh, cutting on funds. Uh, people with addiction often up the, end up there not because of their own choice, uh, because an addiction can often feel inescapable. Therefore, we should help those with uh, drug, uh, drug problems, for example, uh, by establishing an easy way for these people to get help. Legalization of cannabis, uh, a controlled and legal production of cannabis is more safe um, than buying, them, buying it off the street. With, which a lot of people do in countries which, uh, where it is illegal. Uh, it also discourages uh, drug dealers uh, when there isn't a market for it. And make it less taboo for people and more normalized and therefore take away some of, of the excitement. Next, we, have, we talked about there should be a ban on advertisement uh, regarding drugs. So advertisements on drugs, such as alcohol and other harmful substances. Uh, this is connected with the former proposition when it comes to education. Um, this is because ads are harmful when they are uh, about substances like alcohol and other drugs. They have a negative effect on, on people and promote harmful substances in a, uh, in a negative and deceitful manner. We came to the conclusion that Europe's is, Europe is not going to be able to solve all problems, but there are key issues like the environment, democracy, human rights, and focus on the education system that we ha have to focus on. And we also agreed that we in the globalized world have to remain united and promote our values like freedom and democracy, and, but we should never force them but this will also lead to us respecting individuals, countries, values, and different perspectives. And with that being said, the only thing I can add to is that the future is the future, and we are not here to predict what is going to happen. We are just saying what we want to happen, and only time will tell. As regards to the future of Europe, do you think that the fact that young people are leaving their countries in order to go study abroad has a negative influence on the development of their own home countries? No, we don't believe it's going to have a bad influence. We just don't want people to have to go to other countries and have to educate themselves there. Instead, we want them to be educated in their own country and have the possibilities to have the same education system as every, like every other country. That's what we want to focus on, that everyone has equal rights. Hello everyone, my name is Hannah Al Salem Al Ali and I'm from Syria. However, after the war which broke out in my country, I moved to Cyprus. Life there was very difficult for me and my family. Our house had been bombarded and totally destroyed. Essential things such as food or hygiene products became extremely expensive to buy and the feeling of fear, stress and insecurity was prevalent. It gave us no other choice but to abandon our land and settle down in Cyprus, a country which is 
as the number of European Union respects the support and supports human rights. Thank you. The integration process uh, should consist of learning the language and um, because it's hard to start from the bottom, uh, a refugee would be given a starting, a starting package consisting of healthcare, housing and education, as well as a contact family or person who will help them learn the local culture. Um, it is also important to distinguish between migrants and refugees. Um, there are economic migrants and there are political migrants. Economic migrants who are moving to the EU because of a good job should have money with them so they can handle themselves uh, during the first couple of months. And they should be uh, given entry into the EU based on their, uh, on their edu level of education. Thank you very much. On the youth employment uh, discussion, we accepted these topics. They were all of these were accepted. Volunteering programs, uh, so they would get experience. The support of new companies and self-employment, especially direct financial support and reduction of taxes. Talent assessment exams for specialized schools, for example, medical school or electrotechnics. Closer EU cooperation uh, when it comes to increasing youth employment, uh, especially implementing the previously mentioned proposals on an EU-wide level, and encouragement to work abroad, and some kind of expanding of the Erasm Erasmus project. Easier access to housing for students, so they can uh, live more easily and uh, work, live where they work for cheaper. Thank you.